Patrick Shepard. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Uh, thanks very much, Holly. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the Ethics Fundamentals series. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to be joined by Paul Advina, OGE's records officer. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing managing ethics records under the new GRS uh, 2.8. Uh, so, Paul, we're, we're very happy to have you here, so welcome. Uh, and uh, Paul has a great deal of experience to share with us. He's been working in the information management profession for a very long time, uh, serving with a variety of organizations, including the Library of Congress, the National Archives and Records Administration, World Bank, uh, Mobile Corporation, Exxon Mobile Corp, as well as the Export Import Bank. So you have a wealth of information to share, wealth of experience, and we're very excited to learn about managing ethics records under, under the new GRS. Uh, before I turn it over to Paul and get into the slides, I do have one administrative announcement, and that is uh, next Thursday, Lenny Lowentritt from the General Services Administration will be joining us to discuss travel regs in the executive branch. So do look for that uh, training announcement in the next day or so. Uh, so welcome, Paul. Uh, I'm glad you could join us today. Well, thank you, Patrick. It's, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. In fact, it's particularly interesting in, um, for me to get a chance to reach out and talk to many of our ethics officials and their other staff regarding records management issues, uh, both specifically with regards to the new GRS 2.8, which was just released in, um, in early September, but to also use that sort of as a background and as a structure to give you a presentation on some of the other emerging records management issues in ethics program management. Um, and I'm saying this specifically because I am aware of, as OGE is in general, of a number of things that are happening that are affecting, and I'm speaking now of some of the technology changes. Right. And the technology changes go beyond um, our e-filing. Of course, that's the first thing we all think of. Right. But uh, driving a lot of these changes are a number of government uh, decisions that have been made by the president and, um, and by OMB and others uh, that we go fully electronic. Right. And it's very ap appropriate that right now we look at 2.8 and I, we go over it together and I can explain to you and show you some of the options that you're going to have as we start changing, all of our agencies start changing into a fully, I guess what you call a paperless office if, if, if such a thing will ever exist and, and at some point I suspect it probably pretty closely will. So GRS 2.8, we're going to be talking about today just released last month, uh, mandatory um, um, compliance and implementation within six months of receipt. So by March of this coming year, uh, you should have this fully integrated into your processes, uh, whether you are a records officer um, in the agency or whether you are a um, someone working in the, in the ethics program management side of things. Uh, what, is, what does the GRS 2.8 do? It does two things. It tells you what records you've got that you need to man maintain. It tells you how long to maintain them, and then when you've got to destroy them. It's, sim it's as simple as that. Uh, but it isn't quite that simple, only because we've got a very complex collection of forms, documents, and what have you, that have to be managed. And I think sometimes we don't always think about that as, uh, as ethics officials, that we are in charge of a huge diversity of information that's essential to the running of our programs. That's so, right. So knowing how to treat that is, is, yeah. is one of the important parts here. So that, that's that, great. Th it's, it's very true. And uh, I think you're going to see as we go along in this, and I start telling you a little bit about what it's taken to work out some solutions to some of these requirements. And you say, well, what, what, what's the big deal? Well, we're trying to comply with all the statutes that regulate our our, our ethics program records, and I'm talking about the Ethics and Government Act, of course. Right. I'm talking about a number of other statutes we'll be mentioning. I'm talking about NARA's regulations, the National Archives and Records Administration, their requirements for uh, to meet their their regulations for managing program records in general. And then I've still got we've got Office of Government Ethics and what. The Office of Government Ethics has got regulations, and we're trying to comply with those. So we've got three different areas that we're trying to comply with, somebody telling us what to do, and still make it work in your program. Okay, so what we're going to be covering in general um, at this point, we're going to be talking about updates, for one thing. Uh, there's always updates in something new like this, sure. revisions. Right. And the updates are, are, are pretty cut and dry. That's not, going to be a big, that's not going to be a big thing. Some statutory changes, of course, and some new forms. 
and uh, some form name changes and things like that. That's not the big deal. What is important and what I'm really excited about talking to you about today is the fact that the GRS 2.8 is genuinely a new tool that you can use in your, uh, in your agency, in your ethics office, to improve the overall management and ease of management of your ethics records. And, you know, you might say, well, yeah, well, we always hear that. But I think as we go through the, the general record schedule, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. The idea of how this was revised was to help you transition into the new fully electronic environment of record keeping. And as I said before, to our changing into a, a, a eventually a, a complete e-filing system for all filers. I think the old uh, general record schedule, when we talked about e-filing, we were probably thinking about a big filing cabinet with a touchpad on the and side of it. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> it's exactly what it was. It was file cabinets with mm -hmm. lots of files right. in them. So it's a new world and a new, new GRS for um, a, a new environment. It's, it's, it's new for everybody, right. and it's changing very quickly. I, I, I don't think we realize. You know, we've been talking about paperless offices for 20 years now, two decades. What's really pushing the move in the last, I'd say in the last four or five years, the president's memorandum on November of 2011, where he stated, by 2016, you will have an electronic records management system on all your email. And by 2018, you will control all your documents with electronic records management systems, and the National Archives will no longer accept any records that are in paper form. Henceforth, it's got to be electronic. Well, if this doesn't drive it, I think some of the constraints that agencies are experiencing, and I know I've spoken to a number of, of, uh, of you in, um, in offices that have said you're losing your office space. Here in OGE, we had the same thing happen to us. Right. Um, don't we know it and have <laughs> felt it? Uh, uh, there's no space for paper. There's certainly not space for paper the way we used to be able to keep paper. And it, changing to an electronic environment is solving a lot of problems, cost effective, as well as making it much easier to access, manage, and destroy records in their appropriate time. But you need tools to do that, and you need options to do that, because we're juggling with both paper and electronic right now. That's what we're going to talk about in, 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 in great part. So today's session, and I guess we can go to slide one right now, managing ethics under the new GRS. Well, real quickly, I'll tell you what about how we went about doing this, because you might say, well, who revised this? Did the National Archives do this, and then we just had to take with what, what they thought was the best idea for this? Uh, no, it is a National Archives program. They are mandated to maintain and, and create and keep updated a general records schedule for use by all agencies for all those records that are common within each agency. But this particular effort is a very new effort from the very first general record schedule started in about 1948 and went up until about 2005. At that point, NARA realized we've got to change the way this whole system works. It's not working right. And they revamped the whole organization of the system. And we'll, I'll show you a little bit later just how the ethics records fit into this. But we started out and I say we because I was invited to join the working team that NARA had set up. And we started in 2012 with, with our uh, group, which was actually the second phase. First phase had started in 2000, um, I guess, 11. And we started in 2012 with our, my group, which is I was representing OGE, and then we had about four people all over the country from NARA. And we looked at the current. GRS 25 that you should be, have been using and are, may still be using, and that was our starting point. But the whole view, the whole feel of this thing had to be changed. We worked from 2012 to 2013. In, towards the end of 2013, we had a really rough draft, and we sent it out to a number of, a select number of ethics officials. And you may be one of those ethics officials that we sent that original draft, and you'll sort of chuckle when you see how we've changed things from that initial draft. We got some back, back we received some very useful comments from it. And we use it as a basis to further tweak not only those items that were commented upon, but to make that same attitude and that same approach consistent in some of the other items. Um, we worked on this some more. We worked on it through uh, the first part of uh, 2014. And by summertime of 2000, 
14, uh, we were ready to um, go public with this, and we sought public comment through a first round Federal Register notice, and, set, and received some, some comments, took those into consideration in September of 2014, ran our second round in the Federal Register notice, and in January of 2015, uh, the Archivist of the United States signed off on GRS 2.8 for ethics program records, and um, w it was finally transmitted in uh, just this past month. Now, that's a long process. It's a long process, and it took a lot of time. But what's not even evident in that, and I didn't go to all the details in no need to, one of the things, though, that you may say, yeah, but what was our input other than that initial uh, comment that a s several selected a agency ethics officials had made? Believe me, this dra these drafts went through four times. They went through the uh, general counsel at, N at National Archives for tweaking and comments and m slight modifications. And each time general counsel at NARA would change something, then it would come over here to program counsel in OGE, right. and we would change it or tweak it or approve it. So we've had input um, from eight different sessions uh, with two different legal counsels groups looking at this thing to make sure that it would, in fact, meet all needs for compliance for, for, for statutory reasons or from either OGE's regulations or the National Archives Records Management regu regulations. So before we start getting right into the GRS 2.8, I'd like to very quickly, let's talk about a few little terminology things here so we have an idea of some of these terms that we're going to be uh, talking about and uh, their definitions. So, uh, Patrick, can we go to slide two? Um, the first, of course, is, well, what's a record schedule? Before we even get to a general record schedule, what's a record schedule? Um, I guess the best thing is to say it n does three things. Number one, it describes a certain type of record or a group of types of records. Uh, you've got a correspondence series. You've got a training f file series. You might have a um, financial disclosure uh, file series. It, we always deal with these things in file series for control and attaching a disposition to them, as you know. Well, so the general, so the a record schedule has got your, it describes the kinds of records that you've got, possibly even tells you how they're organized. And you uh, may not have them organized that way, but that's okay because you, we'll look at that a little bit later. But you usually, you might say, um, it's the correspondence series and it's alphabetically arranged, or it is the, uh, the uh, ethics uh, counseling files and they're arranged by, uh, by statute or something like that. Or it's the waivers file by, you know, whatever. Okay. So then the, those record schedules, a record schedule itself, an individual one even, it, and then secondly provides you your guidance. What do you, how long do you have to maintain these records and, and how do you have to maintain these records? In order to comply with three main drives, uh, oversight com things, statutory. Statutory, we're talking about the Ethics and Government Act chiefly. And you know that the Ethics and Government Act is fairly unusual. And this is where the problems also come in, the challenges come in rather in, in, in managing these records. It is not that common that Congress passes a bill and the President signs into law, uh, into law um, an act that has the actual disposition, destruction instructions right in the law. But we've got them. And I know you're familiar with them because those financial disclosure reports and a few other documents must be destroyed at a certain time tied to also an, access, an accessibility by, the, by private citizens and the public uh, to see some of these documents. I think that is interesting that the Ethics and Government Act does provide uh, this uh, disposition uh, requirement as well as the access requirement above and beyond sort of the general citizen's access to government data. Uh, so yeah, I understand how that could that could pose a special challenge here. But it had to be that right. way, and I mean that. But that's by the very nature of what the Ethics and Government right. Act is all about. It's about uh, transparency in that the public has a right to see these documents for a certain amount of time, and then they must be destroyed because uh, uh, public servants should not have the obligation to have this material available for public scrutiny for the rest of their lives. Right. And that's the bottom line of this thing. And you might say, well, wh why, wh what's this magic in the six years business? Well, just think about it. The whole thing is dri driven, really, by the statute of limitations for prosecution, criminal prosecution. 
And the statute of limitations on, on prosecution for fraud uh, and, um, uh, and, and misinformation is about six years. So the whole thing driving this, really, the, the, the access to the public is for six years, and then it will be destroyed. That's the end of the time. Um, and so that's the second thing. We've got to look at statute of limitations, and not just for fi financial disclosure reports. They apply to other materials and records that you have, and it is extremely important on that aspect, not so much the destruction, but to make sure you keep them for the required right. six years so they are available should they be needed by justice in a prosecution or others in a prosecution mm -hmm. issue. So you've got that, in your, as I said before, you've got NARA's regulations and you've got uh, the um, uh, Office of Government Ethics, our regulations to implement to comply with um, how long you're maintaining these schedules. And then finally, it gives you the, the disposition uh, instructions. How do I destroy it? When do I destroy them specifically? And you know, regularly, it'll say something like, destroy when three years old. That's a standard program destruction retention time. Three years is, is basic. Well, it doesn't work for a lot of our records because they, remember, we've got to keep them for a statute of limitations for prosecution. But let's say it's a three-year-old record. And we have some records that are three years old that, that you, you just destroy normally after three years old. Sometimes those dispositions are a little bit more um, flexible, and they give you options. And we've tried to do this throughout the new GRS. We've given you a lot more options where we could do that. And it might say instead, for this particular record series, it might say destroy when three years old, but longer retention is authorized if needed for business use. Very important. And we're going to get back to this again, um, especially when we get to talking a little bit about integrity and some of the options you're going to have if you're using integrity or some of the other e-filing systems that now are available to, um, to, to um, ethics program officers. So, so I understand correctly here, Paul, that sort of what we're trying to do is not impose uh, undue retention requirements on ethics programs, but also not require them, if they need some documents for business purposes, to necessarily get rid of them after a certain period of time in these cases. Precisely. Uh, that is exactly what we're trying to do, Patrick. Um, the idea in the past was, you know, NARA says these are mandatory. You must you must comply with them. You must destroy after three years. And now we're looking at these things. You know, we're storing a lot of this stuff electronically. There's not the f it's not a problem that it's going to be filling up a warehouse, a federal records warehouse with stuff. And it's not like it's going to be cluttering up your offices as much, uh, your, your very expensive real estate, uh, office real estate, which you're losing by the square foot every, it seems like, every time we turn around. Um, no, you get some. Di you have some discretion on some of these things, and and, and and there's a lot. Many times, a lot of reasons to retain these things longer than, than than you used to. Re you used to maintain them. So, whenever possible, we are starting to. And Nara is agreeing with this. They're saying yes, we should give um, uh, the users of these schedules and people that are applying them more leeway, and give the program directors more leeway, and, and not snatch these records out from under them just because it happens to be a three-year record, but there's still value in them for the agency. Um, there are also dispositions that can be conditional, and we've got lots of conditions on our, our record schedules. This makes them extremely complex. Well, when I'm working with the, I can tell you it's a little joke that I mentioned a number of times, and we were working with the, uh, with the team rewriting the general record sched uh, the, for ethics program records, and I started going through, well, you know, it, it, if, if it's a nominee and they're waiting for their, 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 their um, um, confirmation from the Senate, uh, then if they don't, well, then there's a contingency that way, and there's a contingency, you know, um, if they withdraw. And uh, we have so many contingencies on when you start the countdown of when you destroy something, at one year or at six years, and then it's always unless it's needed for an active investigation. So there's another contingency you've got to work with. Someone made the comment once in one of these meetings, and they're just trying to understand what's going on with ethics records. They said, geez, you know, I can write a disposition, uh, a disposition uh, schedule for um, decommissioning an atomic submarine easier than I can some of this <laughs> stuff. And it's true. And those are pretty complex schedules, some of those. Uh, let me tell you, because I have worked on mm -hmm. some of those when I did work at NARA. So yeah, we've got some challenges here. And that's why it was particularly important and why I was particularly concerned that we make this as easy as possible to implement and move on. I should also mention there are times when you will be told a certain amount of time 
and this is true for all of our financial disclosure statements, and it'll say, destroy six years after the disclosure report is received in the agency or no longer needed for active investigation. You got a contingency there, and then there will be a note in this new GRS 2.8, and it warns you. It says the instructions are mandatory. Deviations are not allowed. You don't have the option. Oh, I may need that for business use. You don't have that option. And in fact, we've now made that very clear in the new schedules. This, there's no negotiation on this one. There is an uh, the Ethics and Government Act. It must be destroyed. So we move on to slide three. And we're talking about these types of record schedules, and this is simple enough to know, it's pretty obvious. You either have agency-specific ones. These, these pertain to your mission, the reason why your agency exists, the statutory basis for why you exist in the federal government. The more general things, and GRS 2.8 is one of those, these are records that are found in every agency. You've got personnel records, you've got budget records, you've got property management records. And one of the other things you've got are ethics program records now in every executive branch agency. So it's appropriate that they are in the general right. record schedules. And I think that's important to note when we're discussing as ethics officials with our records officers in our agencies that uh, these documents are covered under the general record schedule because sometimes uh, yes. if, uh, if a records officer is not familiar with the nature of our program, they might not realize that these documents exist in every uh, agency across the government. Well, yeah, and I, and I can tell you as, as a records officer for OGE, um, I get a lot of calls and I welcome calls. But I will get calls once in a while from someone in a, um, maybe not in an ethics office, but I'll get them from an IG, and, and, and they'll be asking me about something in, this, in the general record schedule. What is that? And then I know, oh boy, i got to start from the beginning. <laughs> but, uh, and most IGs aren't ready to sit down and listen to me talking, starting from a records management, introduction to records management one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, we're not trying to do that. But uh, that's true. But ethics program records are found in every agency. And they are a general record schedule item for all of your agencies. Now, in OGE, it's different. We are the oversight agency. We cannot use, I, as a records officer in OGE, I cannot apply the general record schedule to my records. Granted, many of my records are going to have the same disposition that you are going to have, but it's a separate authority from NARA because I'm the oversight agency. And it works that way with every agency that's an oversight agency. If they are the oversight agency, they cannot use the general record schedules on their mission critical documents. Right. That makes sense, doesn't it? it? Yeah, it does make sense. Okay, well, let's real quickly compare how the GRS schedule um, of the past the GRS 25 that has an ethics, progr ethics program records, the one that's been used since about 2001, how that looked in the old days. And at slide four, you see pretty much how it's laid out. There's well, like 25 active schedules in it. There had been a couple that were suspended or, or eliminated at some time or another. And it starts, and these are arranged, can you believe, as they were created. So the first one there, civilian personnel records. Every agency's got personnel records, and there's a lot of them, and they take a lot of space. Why should every agency go to NARA and say, how, how long do I have to keep these? When should I get rid of these? So instead, they made uh, general schedules that every agency could follow for personnel records. That one came out in uh, about 1947-48, right after World War II. And Lo and behold, then a, a lot more were added, a few more for personnel type things, or a lot of things for budget, for property management, what have you. And then they got into some more specific things. And finally, uh, uh, ethics programs in general made it to the list of general record schedules, something acknowledged in f first only in 2001. Well, the Ethics and Government Act, you know, is in the late 70s. And in the in early years, you might say, well, what did we do? How did we get, how, how were we able to destroy our, 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 um, our public disclosure reports back in, say, 1980? Well, you used to have an item in Schedule 1, civilian personnel records. It was linked directly in with OPM's personnel records. And we, d we did have a question come in quickly, Paul. I sure. just want to uh, clarify that the, uh, the actual record schedule itself can be found on the MAX page. Uh, we did provide you copies of these materials. Absolutely. So if you want to read them at your leisure, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're looking for where you find those, they're on the registration page where you registered for this course. So uh -huh. a good, good thing to, to good clarify. To know. Good yep. to know. And also you can get, of course, the schedules are all available on NARA's website. 
and there's actually one little information block there that says, get the general record schedules with an exclamation point, and they're right there. <laughs> That's where you go for them. Okay, so you see, you, you got you got the, you, your schedules lined up. There's no rhyme or reason to the way they're organized on, in, in this in, in this cre uh, assembly of these areas that they that they covered. Uh, I can tell you they when they needed an update, sometimes they got updated, sometimes they didn't. Um, when you read through them, and, and for any records officer that's used them, they were inconsistent in terminology, in format. Uh, they had very limited legal citations, and many of them were usually very out of date. And um, uh, there was very little uh, instruction, supporting instructions for specifically how to implement your, your destruction of some of these kinds of records. And um, that's the way the old one was. And there's a good reasons why NARA decided we're going to redesign this thing. We're going to reinvent the general record schedules. And if you look on page five, we sort of compare the two again. And once again, it just underscores what I said before, describes what they were. Um, in the new GRS, they're organized in 14 functional areas within the federal government. Now, well, that's fine. And you say, well, who in the heck figured out what those 14 functional areas are? Those 14 functional areas are actually drawn from the FEA, and I don't know, the Federal Enterprise Architecture. I don't know how many of you folks, um, some of you I'm sure ha are familiar with it. Federal Enterprise Architecture looks at the whole federal government, and it has created this mega architectural model of exactly what functions exist in the government, where they fit and what agencies are related which of those functions. It's something that had to be created as they plan the overall electronic architecture of the federal government in the future. Well, now I went to that, because actually you're supposed to be now looking at that pretty much when you're, as you're, you're working out your strategies for how you accomplish your mission uh, within the, the government. Um, looked at that, and they've identified 14 functional areas that were particularly well-suited initially for general record schedule. Once again, we want to use general record schedules wherever possible because if you've got an agency has a general record schedule to use for the disposition of the records, they don't have to go to NARA individually and ask for unique, separate disposition authorities only for their agency. Okay, so they mapped to the uh, FEA, the Federal Enterprise Architecture, and uh, they came up with 48 sub-functional lines. And guess what? Ethics program records is one of those 48 subfunctional lines. And how does this work for ethics records? Well, on slide six, you will see I've broken out just the first, uh, the, the, uh, I've actually only broken out um, uh, number two. For the first is for all the finance stuff. You see, it's very logically laid out. And, and there are many subfunctions under finance. And if you're a budget director, you're starting to get some of these because some of these are, are completed. But I'm only going to really look at number two of these 14 functional areas, and that's human resources. And you see where ethics records 2.8 falls within that human resources uh, uh, functional, 14 functional areas. I also point out, just because it's very interesting, they've kind of broke these up also, the logic of this. Those functions that are more of administrative support, and then those that are really directly tied to the mission areas. They're not the actual mission of the agency, but they support the mission of the agency directly. And in that category, they've added a lot of new ones that you won't find in that original 25 or 26 um, uh, general record schedule. There never used to be an executive leadership general record schedule or public affairs or legal support or legislative and congressional relations. Every agency had to go in and get their own schedules for these. Now they're going to have them in the new GRS. So it's going to be a much more sort of a mega schedule that's going to eliminate the need for a lot of these individual unique schedules that agencies used to have to come in to, to pull down. Now, we were fortunate. Ethics program records, this is a five-year project to revamp this whole thing, could have just as easily been coming at the end, and you would have been seeing our GRS, the new GRS 2.8 at the end of the schedule of the, um, you know, 2017 or 2018. We were lucky to get, and the only reason I got ours in <laughs> early is because they were starting with personnel and number one, because there were so many critical issues with personnel records that I had see. to be updated. That makes so sense. we kind of got in under the, that one, and it's, it's to our benefit, believe me. Uh, we need some of the things that we've created in GRS 2.8 to help you get through these changes that are happening now with, with all this electronic changeover. So now, if you look at um, uh, uh, slide seven here, um, 
I'm going to talk now a little bit, first of all, broadly about well, what are some of these new changes in the overview in 2.8 for ethics program records. And there are a lot of routine uh, changes. And the most routine ones were uh, we had to change statutory authorities on some of these things. You want to always tell someone if they're going to apply a disposition to it, they should know what statute is driving the destruction at a specific time. And we have some very specific ones in the Ethics and Government Act, but that's been amended, of course, by the Stock Act of 2012. And so that was a big changeover for us, and that did change. It also created, as it generated a new form. You know, we have the 278T. It's the periodic transaction report. The periodic transaction report. Not yes. a consideration in the old GRS. Yes, it, it was exist. not. It, when it didn't exist in the old. And we've renamed just about all the forms now, as you've been trying to keep up with it. I mean, we started <laughs> out with an SF-278 just a few years That's ago. Right, and we're yes. not, we've gone through an iteration of 278 variants, and we're on, now on the 278E, the OGE form 278E. It's not the SF anymore. We removed it from the standard forms program a number of years ago to have more flexibility and be able to change it without going through the GSA standard forms program all the time because we need that flexibility as we're trying to adjust to the, these new statutory requirements and and what have you. Um, so there were updates to the, to the form, uh, new new forms like the OGE form uh, um, uh, 1353s that you're reporting your uh, non-federally refunded um, uh, travel e expenses and what have you. Um, that was okay and that was no big deal. That was the easy part of this whole thing. Um, more importantly, though, as I said before, the whole idea was to establish some goals and then consistently apply them to all the kinds of records you have in your office that would meet certain, Im improve the user I experience uh, and making it easier for you to implement the schedule. Because if it's easier for you to implement it, you're going to implement it more likely. And you're not going to say, I don't understand this gibberish. It's irrelevant to me, and it doesn't help me one bit. This stuff, I hope, will help you. So what are the goals? Well, slide eight, you see exactly, we've laid them out. They basically were, what do we do to make this more understandable, to make it flexible for how you happen to organize your records? Because the way they're, they're laid out in the general record schedules may not be just the way you're quite organizing these files. And then, therefore, they will be more implementable. So we had uh, a series of criteria, and I'm now going through a number of these, and I'll show you very briefly a couple examples in detail for just two of these slides of what we mean by how we make things more understandable, flexible, and therefore more implementable. One of them was clear, explicit file series descriptions. There are any number of times in the old GRS 25 you could miss where some of these gems were buried in terms of where your documents were in what category, which disposition instructions you should apply to them. And a good example would be item number one in the old GRS 25. Well, that was the old catch-all for all of your general ethics program records. And it was truly a, a, a catch-all. It had everything in it. It had all your counseling uh, records in it. It had all your waivers that you granted. It had um, uh, a host of things, everything except practically your training records and your um, financial disclosure forms. And what used to be in GRS 25, they, it wasn't really very clear if you were just going at this very quickly. You had both three-year records to destroy it, three records, and mixed in with this, you had six-year records. Records that were needed to be retained to meet statute of, uh, statute of um, limitations uh, for criminal prosecution. Uh, uh, anytime you're, you know, you're, you're doing your, um, uh, your counseling or your interpretation on um, your conflicts of interest statutes, you've got to keep that for six years because someone may be prosecuted as a result of the guidance that you provided to them, right? Well, why should you have to go through your files every year trying to find three year or ones to destroy <coughs> right away versus six years? We looked at this thing and we said, fine, you keep it all together, but let's just make it six years. You don't have to go through and purge That, that, that makes sense. Years. So by, by reducing the requirement to go and find those that don't deal with the statutory issues and destroy them after three, we save that administrative exercise uh, for ethics officials. Exactly. We're just trying to cut the amount of, 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 of time you have to spend massaging these things in, in their maintenance stage. And in the new replacement for item one, which is the new item uh, 010, 
eth general ethics program files, you're going to see we change it to six years for all of them. You ju just keep it for six years. Don't worry about three-year ones. Just let them float on. And then notice though also, we've given you one of those new options. Longer retention is authorized. If you want to keep them longer, they would be useful. For, well, I don't know what ethics officer wouldn't want to keep more of these longer than that. Surely on some of your counseling files and other things like this, you're going to want to keep these for uh, a, a fair amount of time be because it, they're a history of how you're dealing with certain unique I issues within your agency, for example. So when we're talking about the advice and counsel records, uh, we can sort of put them on the same schedule as the financial disclosure, the six well, years. Well, yeah, they're, they're six no, years because once again, it's a, it, there's a statute here. I mean, right. they're not, they're not, they're not, um, they're, they're not actually specified in the Ethics and Government Act. But we do know that, that they will be needed right. and, if, and for, to satisfy for that, statute limitations. For that six-year period. But yeah. we're not required to go find those that don't fall into that requirement to yeah. exercise a three-year period. So that does simplify things a lot for us. And that's the whole purpose of this thing. I mentioned also, there's also you'll see that in the old, in the old uh, GRS number two, we, had, uh, we buried in that the, uh, in the whole general background information uh, supporting information for your, your, your financial disclosure reports. This means all your reviewers' notes, all of your communications with the filer to clarify things that may be, uh, uh, that, were, that, that, that turned up on the report, or supporting documentation. I mean, you know, when you're doing your own background investigation of some of the, uh, uh, of the investments or whatever that are being reported on the form, you know you've got a lot of stuff, and, and in the old GRS, we tied that directly to the disclosure report, and we said, you destroy anything related to a specific report when it's ready for the report to be destroyed, whether that's after one year or after six years. We've broken that apart, and I'm gonna, you're going to see why shortly uh, uh, to give you some more options. W one of the things that we did is we took out the 201. That's a six-year record, and that's important that we keep that for six years. Then what we did was... Um, we c and we created a new categories for the uh, for the actual disclosure reports. You know whether they're the public, whether they're the confidential, or whether there are other alternative uh, means for giving the uh, financial disclosure that's required. We separated those actually from all that related documentation, and we did that specifically to give you the opportunity option to keep all that related documentation as long as it is useful for you related to that filer. So in other words, we've now said, yes, the financial disclosure reports must be destroyed after the one year or after the six year. But all that related material, it's not mentioned in the, federal, in the, um, in the uh, Ethics and Government Act. All that related material, you have now the option as of the dis transmittal last month of this new general record schedule of keeping all that material and carrying it on from year after year. So in other words, you've got a 2008 uh, financial disclosure right. and it's ready to destroy. You do not have to remove all the related materials to that, the transmittal letters, I need your reviewer notes and what have you, uh, and destroy those as well. You can if you want. You have that option. or. You may set those aside or keep those in the folder for that file. Uh, I see. So this is very helpful for those of us who process new entrant reports, because very often the new entrant uh, report of a financial disclosure filer, there's a lot of research that goes in at that stage that we rely upon in our subsequent reviews. Uh, so if we have someone who serves in a role for, say, seven or eight years, we can maintain that research for our benefit in future reviews. Is that, is that kind of what's going on here? Patrick, you hit it right on the head. And the thing is, it's from our own experience here at OGE, that's the way we're now doing it ourselves. We have to do it that way. Right, because otherwise and you have to rebuild all that research. We have to rebuild all this research each time. Right. And you can think of it, in our case, we are bringing, sometimes you know that when someone go, leaves the administration and they, they file their um, annual, the combined annual term uh, report, and it's going to stay on for six years. And let's say it's four years down the pike and it's going to be around for two more years. And uh, a subsequent administration, a president, nominates that person for another position somewhere. We pick up that material, okay. not the reports. The reports have to be destroyed right on schedule when they're six years old. But we pick up all that supporting material and we add it to the new folder for the right. new position. And we can maintain that. Immensely valuable. And you say, well, how can that be of value to you? Well, I don't have to tell you. Anybody that reviews reports knows. Uh, something that occurred or something that clarifies, say, an obscure family trust or something that's like exact, that. That's from, exactly the, I mean, you just say the, the that trust and ask the, the, is going to persist exactly. and you do that analysis. And once you've
you've done it, you exactly. want to keep it. And something else that, uh, not so much here in OGE because we do have that continuity, but when you have changeover in your ethics program offices, someone new picks up reviewing reports. They may not be as familiar with that particular right. filer. And something that they just know about that filer that got destroyed when you were methodically destroying these reports right. at six years back, we have to they're reinvent gonna that they have again. to reinvent this each right. time. So it gives people that are new, that are coming into your office, a chance to pick up from the history of those. This is fully legal. NARA approves that we do it. And the only important thing is, and I warn you about this, when you are ready to destroy your last report, the last report is six years old, then you must destroy that whole file that preceded right. it. And the reason the reasons are a privacy act that, that, that runs out. You don't have an authority anymore under OGE Government 1 or OGE Government 2 for confidential to continue maintaining them beyond that period. But up until then, you've got a genuine need if in business use and option to do it. Now, the reason that actually finally drove this decision and this change, and it's a big one, is integrity. You've got a whole array of new integrity option, options right. for managing your records and integrity. And as integrity grows and expands, you have even more options. I have been participating with our project managers on the development of integrity since day one and watching out for the records issues and seeing where we can give you as the ethics officials and others, others operating in your programs options on managing the, the, the documents t tied directly to that e-file, e-filing. And one of the things in integrity, which you probably haven't looked at yet or don't, haven't a need for yet because you don't have records in the system that are old <laughs> enough yet, right. but when the records start coming up for destruction and they ask you, do you want to re destroy this record at six years old, you're going to have the option of keeping either destroying the, the actual disclosure report as well as all the related documentation that you created and you saved in integrity at the same time, or you will say, destroy the report, keep all the related documentation. And the system integrity will mm -hmm. carry that forward until the final report is ready for destruction, probably an annual term or a term, and it'll say, you have all these other Right. Uh, related documentation from so many years, uh, we're going to destroy it. And you will have the final decision to destroy, and you will destroy, I hope, unless, what? Doesn't You've got an open investigation. An open investigation, and, and, exactly. And that's how we're going to catch that. Yeah, that so That's going to make life a lot easier right. for, uh, for our career filers who might stay on for many, many years. We can continue to get look back at those. And that's, and and, and, and that's pr precisely the case. So um, I've gone into a little bit more detail on this because it's an important one. And it took a little sorting out to make sure we were covering everything from every angle on this and what we were uh, proposing that we keep and giving you the authority to maintain things that longer period of time. So let's just move on now. And if you have questions, we can, we can, we, I'm going to be happy to answer them either during this session today or uh, as follow-ups. And we'll get to that towards the end of, the, uh, of, of, our, of our presentation today. Let's move on to, to slide number nine, consistent use of terminology. Well, I'm not going to go into any specific area of the GRS um, 2.8. Let me tell you, and I think you'll see it, it's very consistent. We caught many times where, you know, you, you use it just a little bit different word or something and somehow someone using this and trying to read it literally word by word says wait a minute this must mean something else because they're using a different word here no I think you'll see that things are very consistently arranged throughout the um, uh, throughout the, the series of schedules on, f on slide 10 uh, another thing to make things understandable flexible and ultimately Im implementable for you standardized expanded disposition instructions and I'm going to just give here um, two little examples, actually. One of them, real briefly. Um, you know, when I'm, when I, what I brought into this team's work are some of the things that I have noticed in the uh, 10 or so years that I have been working here in OGE. Uh, comments from uh, program reviewers that are out looking at your records uh, when they're doing, conducting program reviews. Questions that some of you have called me and asked about or questions that you've contacted our, our, our desk officers and they've relayed the questions to me about. And I brought those to the table as we were revising these, these, these schedules. One of the things that comes up repeatedly, and it applies to any of you, uh, any age of your agencies that are using the 450A. And I know not all agencies use them for various reasons, but if you are using 450As, there seems to be a um, consistent 
misinterpretation of the destruction of a 450 after six years and destruction of a 450 after either um, seven years or longer, depending upon how many outstanding uh, 450As you have that rely upon that 450 for oh, support. Oh, that's right. Yes, because it, uh, yeah. it's, uh, and it so incorporates you, it by reference. Yeah, it incorporates it by reference. Exactly true. And so the the problem is, uh, well, our you know our program reviewers are sometimes been looking at some of your uh, your, your 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 financial disclosure reports, and all they've got is the 450A, <laughs> and it's certifying that something that no longer exists is the same. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so. We made that much clearer. You'll see that in, 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 in new items 071 and, 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 and 072 for confidential 450s and 450As. Uh, there's something else. We tried to explain and clarify a little bit. The 270AT, everybody had said, well, no, that's going to be a six-year record. Right. Patrick, I think you know that it's got to be a year longer than the six years because the 278s come in. Oh, to your true. offices before the two, before you receive a 278 that summarizes and 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 and, and, and accounts for those I see, periodic we need, transactions we, that have occurred during the year. We need them for reconciliation you purposes them, on them, the them, annual yes. report because we, the, we again incorporate them by sort of by reference. Yes, and the thing is, the the bottom line is, remember, you're keeping these for public access, and public access means that the public has the right to t look at all those. 278Ts that went into right. that uh, uh, 278 of a filing for an annual or what have you. Right. So once again, we've tried to clarify and make it clear why you're keeping these as long as you are. So you're going to keep a, you're going to destroy a, a, a seven. Uh, uh, you're going to you're going to keep you're going to destroy a seven year periodic transaction uh, transaction reports with the sixth year. Two disclosure report, yeah, the right, because those year. because those PTRs right. become part of the annual record. That makes right, sense. Right, right. Now the next thing is, I want to talk to you very br briefly, but in, on an issue that is coming up repeatedly, and I'd say someone asks us about it at least once a month right now. Why? Because everyone is being moved to the um, uh, an electronic environment, and this has to do with media neutrality uh, that I mentioned on slide 11 there. But let me just talk to you for a few minutes about, um, about media neutrality. What are we talking about with media neutrality? Where does this come from? This is not something that we talk about normally in, in an ethics environment, right. in an ethics program. In 2008, the National Archives released, uh, issued a, a bulletin stating that at that point, in recognition of the fact that so many agencies were converting so many records into electronic files to save space and for ease and retrievability over the paper, that NARA said, you know, if you've got temporary records in your agency, all of our ethics program records are temporary, temporary records, right? yep. And they're scheduled. You've got a schedule. You had GRS 25. And so you knew when to destroy them right. after one year or after six years. You are allowed to photocopy, uh, not a photo, well, photocopy, that wouldn't have helped. <laughs> you, would, uh, you were allowed to run them through a uh, scanner, make PDFs, for example, d declare the PDFs to be your record set, and destroy the paper originals. Okay. Even if they're your inked signature original certified copies. Hey, we're saving space, we can right. retrieve them, and after six years, you delete them from your, your, your drive. Okay. Simple job. Immediately after NARA released that uh, media neutrality policy, our, our director at the time, Rick Husick, issued a, de a deogram, some of you I know remember it, where we sort of countermanded that. And we said, wait a minute, this is not going to be applied, cannot be applied to two, any financial disclosure reports, 450s or 278s. All of your 278s and your 450s that are in paper inked certified are to be maintained okay. as such. Go ahead and, and make PDFs of them for your, your, your routine use but and put your paper in storage, send them off to a federal record center, but you've got to maintain them. Gotta maintain them. Why? Once again, it's the, it's, it's the old, um, we have a statute of limitations and this gets into the potential use for these in a in a in a, in a, in a criminal prosecution right. and their uh, their their admissibility as evidence in court, and this goes back to what Department of Justice has required consistently with records that they may need for a criminal prosecution, 
we've got to have the best evidence we can go into court with. We don't want defense. So does, does GRS 2.8 continue that practice of requiring us to, to keep the wet signatures? And that's where, that's where, we, and that's where this comes in, uh, 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 Patrick. At first, when we were drafting this, we were going to repeat those guidelines for you, that you had to keep those, what some call the wet signatures, the original signed copies. We removed that. And you will see in the new GRS 2.8, there's no mention of the original versus the um, a PDF. We, do, we don't go there. And the reason we don't go there is because, first of all, let's break it up into two parts. There's two parts to this whole thing. One is electronic signatures. An electronic signature in itself is no problem. They're admissible in court every day of the, of the year. That's right. not the issue. If something is born electronically in an e-filing system, no problem. These are, uh, you, you don't have any so, issue. So standard practice nowadays That's standard to practice. have, have evidence. We're not taking any issue with that. The problem is the process you have to go through to convert a paper document to a PDF leaves you very vulnerable and leaves anyone taking this into court to prosecute vulnerable to, for challenge by the defense. And the reason being that it's a matter of your being able to authenticate that this is a perfectly accurate copy right. and that it absolutely reflects precisely what was on that inked original okay. that has been shredded and we don't have it anymore. You, we've had a number of instances already where the defendants, the defense has, is challenged, and they've, de they've challenged it, and they said there was other schedules attached to this. Why weren't they scanned along with the, with right. the cover sheet? This, is, the this is incomplete. It's or incomplete. It's or uh, if there's anything amiss about that PDF, if the scanning machine ran them at a diagonal or something like that, one right. of the sheets at a diagonal. Well, a folded corner folded or something corner. like that. I think we've even heard of, a, of an, an example where they said that the wrong uh, certification sheet was attached to the wrong <laughs> version, iteration of the uh, of the actual 278 report. These are serious. Right, that's and they can concern. make a big difference in a prosecution. OGEs are not in the position of telling you uh, what you've got to do to get these things to make them you know, admissible in court. Right. That's, not our, that's not our problem. We have to tell you there is this issue. Um, the most important thing that I guess um, you've got to do about this is you've got to work with your, 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 your litigation specialists in your general counsel, along with your CIO, I guess, and work out what is going to be acceptable, what is going to be an acceptable risk, because one of you is going to have to face someone over injustice if this ever comes to a point where they need that document for, for um for, for in, 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 in a prosecution. So what we're doing here is we're, we're flagging this issue for agencies. We understand it's a concern, yes. and we're mm -hmm. asking them to use mm -hmm. their judgment mm -hmm. to determine what level of sort of risk that they're willing to tolerate or what processes or internal controls they're going to put in place in order to manage this risk. And it manages it. We know that there are, you can, you can run a PDF, you can make a PDF, and you can then uh, run that PDF through an authentication system and have the individual sign it electronically. electronically. That may not be enough. Right. And I'll tell you what happens is um, it probably will need an ind individual to actually individually certify each time each PDF is made. That the, and they the certify, I certify that all of this PDF is absolutely accurate, it is complete, and it, it completely reflects the inked copy. And I mean, maybe that will do it. I am not an attorney, and I, but I just alert you, if you're the person destroying the records or considering one changeover to one of these systems, which is exactly what we're supposed, we're supposed to, be to be doing, doing right. uh, that you take this into consideration when it comes to, to these reports. And they're voluminous. We've got, what, almost a half a million 450s now being filed every year. Which that's, is, that's a lot, a lot when you paper. consider the fact you're, you're keeping them for six years. Right. That's, that's, we're that's we're that's storing in the federal government million. Three, three, million, three, million. <laughs> three million just on that alone. Right. So, um, my, my, my answer to you then is this is something that you're going to have to decide where the risk is and what level of risk you want to take before you simply convert everything to a PDF and then shred, destroy the, uh, the, the, um, the originals. Um, it's your decision. It's not OGE's decision. And you can, 
explain to justice, as we said, where the originals are, why you did it that way. Well, that's great, though. Does that make sense? Uh, that's the best we can do right now. And I think it gives you the option. Once again, you've got the option. It, you, you're, 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 you're calling the shots on how you want to do this. Let's go back to now slide 12. I mean, move on. We can answer other questions about this if you, ha if you want more specifics about that. In slide 12, um, once again, we're back at what's the most understandable, flexible, therefore the most implementable for you to do. We've given you this alternative retention whenever possible for e-filing electronic record keeping systems. We talked about the actual dis disclosure reports and breaking it up separate from all that supporting documentation so that you could create your own history and maintain that stuff until the last report filed is six years old and then you destroy all those records along with that last report. Um, uh, um, and actually, Paul, we have, uh, we have uh, a question coming in through the Hangout, ah. and uh, I think this is, this is a good question, and it goes back okay. to, uh, to the concern about scanning uh, and electronically retaining the documents. Yes. And uh, I think Dawn asks, uh, does this apply only to the financial disclosure, so, or uh, do ethics advice uh, files, opinions, outside activity approvals, etc., uh, do we need to sort of exercise or do a similar uh, consideration or risk uh, decision uh, based on those records if we're going to keep them electronically? Um, not quite the same thing, I don't think. Okay. Uh, you've got very specific things in the financial disclosure right. report, and you do have financial, uh, very specific things that are, uh, say, in uh, counseling files, but um, if somehow something is unreadable in the... Um, I mean, you've got the issue, but right. I, I think that uh, if, if you're missing a page in your counseling files, right. um, you're missing a page in your counseling files. And I think there's another difference in that the financial disclosure report, we have the filer certifying to the accuracy of the yeah, document. Yeah, good point, with, with, Patrick. With the, good with point. the advice, it's the, the government official who's providing the advice, and presumably that person could be asked if this yes. advice is accurate. Yes, uh, yes. If, if that correctly represents yes. the provider. Yes. So I think, you know, I think it's, yeah. it's good for folks to think about, yeah. um, but maybe it's not quite the same consideration. Yeah, and I mean, Dawn, that's a good question. Uh, you know, does this apply across the whole range? Uh, another thing, waivers. And the person signing the waiver, mm. how long do you keep a waiver? Well, we keep it, we think, for six years, uh, until six years after the waiver is no longer in, in, in use or is no longer um, effective. Um, but in some respects, unless you're tracking those employees and you know who is exactly in which job and which jobs are still relying on that right. waiver, when do you know when to destroy a waiver? You really don't, do you? And in that case, the only thing you can do is keep them for a real long time until that individual is, you're sure, no longer in the system because the person could theoretically be prosecuted and go to prison for doing something that he had a waiver for right. if you don't have the waiver and right. he doesn't have the waiver. Right. We take it very seriously here in OGE, and I will tell you, waivers that have been sent to us by you in the ethics programs, either as a, as a co-consultative thing or ones that you just send us FYI, right. we've never destroyed a single one. And in fact, as we've gone into a fully, just about paperless environment here, I have had scanned, um, I don't know, probably a uh, hundred thousand of them or something like that. We've got a lot of waivers here because we don't know who is still in that position maybe 15, 20 years later and still is relying on that waiver. Right. That is possible. So you've got to kind of look at some of these things. Um, uh, when you're um, thinking about how long, right. you know, what's six years after what? <laughs> right, you know, exactly. when, you, when can you start counting the six years, that's you know? Right. No, that's very interesting. So yeah. I got off on the subject a little bit about that, but it's all part of the same thing, how we're trying to right. manage at, at, a, at a very different level than going right. into paper files. And also thinking about the purpose of all these records and the, the needs that might arise for them and uh, making good decisions to, to retain them uh, so that they can meet those needs. That's exactly right again. Um, I think uh, if we move on to, ch to slide 13, um, once again, understandable, flexible, and implementable so that they are these, these, these uh, schedules are in a, implementable. One of the things I never understood when I first looked at GRS uh, uh, 25 when I first started working as records officer here in OGE was why in the world does the general record schedule have something pertaining to presidential and vice presidential candidates? <laughs> if you've got records common to most uh, government offices that have records related to that, there's something seriously wrong here. <laughs> Those <laughs> records do not belong in your offices and I think you would agree. So we took out things that, yeah, they're in the law, 
and they're used to apply, but there are only two agencies that really need. Right. Um, uh, so those shouldn't be in the government-wide <laughs> schedule. Your 101Cs are either going to be the Federal Election Commission or OGE. Right. So, uh, we, you know, once again, we're just trying to clean up things that um, uh, that don't need to be in there. They're just stuff that you have to stumble over when you're trying to get the information that you need quickly and efficiently. So I think we've covered the, the main uh, the main components of GRS 2.8 at this time. Um, eventually, when all the sections of this are completed, uh, NARA will be producing an electronic versions of this that can be directly downloaded into your, when agencies have their own electronic records management right. s keeping systems, and they will automatically delete the electronic records oh, based upon the, o the uh, uh, NARA GRSs. And I mean, of course, it's going to be a problem with ethics records, I can tell you that right now, because there are so many contingencies on these <laughs> That's right. They're not going to sort of self-delete as a rule. I ha would like to go into one other, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, well, I actually had two slides. I had a 14, and I, this is just sort of a, um, uh, an overview, uh, once again, of all the things that we were trying to to. The, the, the little features that we are trying to tweak or add to the GRS 2.8 to meet our goals of making things understandable, flexible, and implementable. I've added on, on, on slide 15, and I have to mention this, and you're going to wonder what is going on here. In GRS 25, as you know, you had a, a disposition authority for training records. Training records are folks, let me tell you, they are in, important. And guess what? They're covered by a statute of, of limitations for prosecution. That's why they are so important. Most training records and agencies are three-year straight program records. Ours are different. They are used in a prosecution. If justice needs, they will use anything they ne necessary in, in a prosecution. That may be 1353 um, uh, transport, uh, 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 your, your travel reports. Um, you know, refunds from uh, non-federal sources. Um, it may be your, dis your disclosure reports. It may be your waivers files. It could be your counseling files. I told this individual this on such and such a date. I've got it in my files. And the person is on the stand, the defendant, and he says, I've never heard of this before in that's my right. life. Well, likewise with training. you got to document, and that's why it's written this way. Who attended your general training courses? Right. What you actually covered in the course, it may end up as evidence in court. So we keep those for six years. And they are broken out. The National Archives wanted to tie all the training records for all, all throughout the government into its own GRS subfunction uh, training. See, just for training, training. Six. Right. And I argued with them. I said, please, can we just keep it with all the other ethics? All the stuff? other ethics. No, I, well, we did not prevail, and we tried on that <laughs> one. And as a result, but as you see, they had to make exceptions, so many exceptions, right. to accommodate our ethics and government uh, needs for these things. That if you now 2.6, I'm giving you a sheet of a draft. This is not official yet, but so when you're looking at your 2.8 and you say, "Well, where are my training records?" They're not there. It's we haven't changed the disposition for them. They're going to be the same as they are in the G old GRS 25. They will be issued along with the r other training records guidelines in GRS 2.6. And it's buried way towards the back, and it's item 050, and it's our good old ethics training records, and it's destroyed six years after the training event. Longer retention is authorized. You can keep them longer, but you cannot destroy them sooner, and it's because of that. Other times, when we do allow program records to be destroyed after three years, such as your 1353 travel record reports, you have to remember that we're working in tandem with you, your agencies, and NARA and Justice has determined we need those for six years, but we don't have to keep them in two places for six years. Therefore, on travel reports, we give the agencies a break because they're voluminous and they're a pain to keep maintained. You can destroy them after three years, but the only reason you're able to destroy those after three years is because OGE keeps them for six years in the event justice needs those for a prosecution. So just so you know, there's a whole reason and a network of trade-offs of how right. we try to cover uh, making sure we've got the right records in the right place at the right time, especially if a prosecution comes <laughs> up. <Right. laughs> <laughs> well, it's, very, it's very interesting, the, uh, the role that the records uh, 
the general record schedule plays in the enforcement regime. I think as ethics officials, we don't always think of it that way. We think of it as sort of an administrative uh, exercise and a, a, a housekeeping exercise, but really it's critical uh, to the enforcement piece of the work that we do. So, uh, so that's great. Uh, do you have some time for, for a few questions? Yes, I certainly do. And in fact, uh, the two that we've received already are good ones. And uh, uh, has anybody else? No. Well, we can, uh, Holly, if we could open it, uh, the, the phone's up for questions. Okay. So if anyone on the phone has a question. And I remind those of you on the Hangout, if you have a question, you can ask it by typing it in the uh, box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And we'd be happy to entertain those. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question over the phone, please unmute your phone, press star 1, and record your first and last name clearly one prompted so I may introduce your question. To withdraw your question, press star 2. Again, ask a, to ask a question, star 1. One moment, please, for incoming questions. Well, uh, sometimes it takes folks uh, a few minutes to get their questions typed in well, or come over the phone. And this is sort of a complex presentation. Let's face it, this is not stuff that we're all doing every day. No, and, and, uh, well, I, I do it every day. <laughs> right. I learned something on the very first slide. I didn't, GRS, I, I'd heard that many well, times. Ever, yeah, yeah, what it's is the GRS? general record schedule. Now, now, yeah, now we know. So it is. It's, uh, it's a nice break from the, uh, the topics that we discuss you know, day in, day out as ethics officials to sort of look at the bigger picture and some of these other authorities we have to be considerate of. I think it's important, though, to, to realize that, uh, and I think we, we've tried to explain that today, these schedules are meant to support what you're trying to do in your, in your ethics program. They genuinely are. And the tr and, you know, and, um, but but it's, it's a complicated. There are so many conditionals. There are so many things that you're weighing each time. Right. Of where, you know, what, what it, well, we can we do it yet? Well, no, we have to also consider this right. sort of thing. And it's a matter of knowing what you have to consider as much as, as anything. No, I think that's, that's the biggest takeaway that I've found uh, today is that there are lots of considerations we should be making when we decide to uh, retain or destroy a record <laughs> or when we're looking for the schedule that requires us to destroy it. Or, uh, you know, when we're considering these issues, there are more considerations than just w how long has elapsed. I exactly, and uh, I'll tell you, um, when your records officer uh, for your for your departmental records officer or whatever your agency records officer is, when he starts scratching his head or she starts scratching her head and just saying, what is, you know, I can't figure this out. Can you interpret this for me? Right. <laughs> um, believe me, um, uh, uh, it's because of the complexity of these. These just seem so, they seem, in some respects, needlessly complex, but we have so many different constrictions in which we are working. I'm not uh, showing any questions on okay. the Hangout. And Holly, do we have any on the phone? I show no questions on the phone, but if you would like okay. to ask a question, please press star 1 on your text tone phone. Excellent. Thanks very much. Maybe some people are just thinking about this because right. they've got to now kind of fit this to their own, their mm -hmm. own situation in their agencies. And um, as I said, I acknowledge the fact that you may not keep the record is exactly the same way that the schedule is lined up. Then you've got to find which ones of these schedules apply to the kinds of records that you've right. got in, the, in your files. I mean, that's, that's okay. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's nothing saying they have to be organized that way. So it may take people a little bit of a while to kind of figure out and sort out, yeah, well, right. now that means we can go into this file series, even though they call it this and right. the GRS 2.8. For us, that is this. That's right. You know, and then especially if you're at the departmental level and you're um, thinking about some of your other um, your, your, your sub-agencies or right. sub-components and how they're doing things, um, sometimes it can get a little bit uh, confusing as you try to figure out now how, how do we get this out as a consistent uh, guideline right. <laughs> in terms of what you're doing. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, part of the, that's part of the excitement of this, uh, this profession. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I suspect uh, you know, this is going to be one of those presentations where people go back and, and take, a, uh, take a look at the, the GRS. That's and usually then, the way it is. And then they'll have some that's questions. And it, as always, your desk officers here at OGE stand ready to help you with any questions you might have. Uh, so you can get in touch with us for those. Um, and I think we're just about out of time. So, Paul, thank you very much for joining us. I well, think this welcome. is extremely helpful. Yes. You have one question online if you'd like to take it. Oh, yes. Sure. We, uh, great. We have a sure. question coming in over the phone. Mr. Wayne Johnson, your line is open. Am I live? Uh, yes. Hi, yes, you are. Hi, Wayne. Welcome. Uh, I, I have uh, sort of one comment and one question. My comment is, is if I could summarize in my small mind, the ink signature debate that would be at your and it's probably the wisest thing to do so you won't ever upset Department of Justice is to keep the original ink signature document uh, and if you're running out of space I guess uh, have that archive someplace off-site if you want to 
PDF it so that ink signature still is around because it's, if I understand what you guys are saying is that this is really a Department of Justice, not an OGE call. Correct. That's, that's absolutely that's correct. That, and you are exactly. dead on right. And, I, and you want to know something, sir? What you just described is what OGE is doing. You know, we're, we're going vir virtually paperless. We don't have space for the file room to keep the, t uh, what, uh, 12,000 folders of right. all, all of our classification folders for all of our, our, all of our 278s. And we have scanned them. We use scanned copies for all of our day-to-day uh, work. Day -to -day work. And we have not shredded any of them. But we don't access them anymore. They're in dead storage. And that's because we cannot afford to put them up on shelves. We don't have the space to do it anymore. And yet we're covered. And you know, the problem is along this, these things, invariably, it's the, 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 the prosecution will, uh, it'll probably for a really high profile case. Right. And, those, and it, it just isn't good when you don't have the absolute best evidence available. Right. And so y you're right. That's exactly what we're doing here in OGE. Yeah, and my question, that I had is uh, on the 1353 trial you said well we only have to keep it for a uh, quote three years because you guys keep it what we send you every six months for six years right yes correct uh, but since I'm tangentially involved with making sure HHS's big report gets to OGE yes every six months what we send you folks is very, very summarized. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, all the, how shall I put it, deep thought paperwork and stuff like that. Uh, if we don't send that to you, that's all just summarized on the 1353 form. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not, not that I want to get people upset, but gee, I think it'd be wise that if the agencies kept it for uh, six years instead of three, but then again, that would apparently have require a uh, change to the general record schedule. And we don't want to do that, of course. It's, it's, it's ironic you're mentioning GRS 9 travel transportation records. Back in my days in NARA, back about 1993 or 92, mm -hmm. I revised those and updated them, <laughs> in fact, and tried to help explain what the difference between travel, what the difference is between travel, government travel and, and government transportation, and uh, <laughs> a few other things. And I remember that your encumbering documentation was six years, uh, but your program, just your, your normal files are three years, and they would not be around for the six year uh, uh, statutory limitations need. And that's a good point. And um, uh, I should ask around about it again. I, I was under the impression that, uh, but if your agency's not, the whole idea though was that the agencies, and I remember we had a long dialogue with Justice about this. Uh, the, 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 the dialogue was that the, it was a burden on the agencies, and the agencies should not have to keep it for six years. Therefore, quote, OGE would keep it for six years. But I don't think it was ever intended that we were keeping all of the, uh, the uh, actual documentation for the encumbrance you of the drown money. With all the paperwork. I was sure. <laughs> yes. I can listen. I can just the report that you send to OGE is pretty substantive. I've I've gone through that thing a couple of times. I, I you know I can imagine what it takes to p compile that thing. <laughs> well, thank God it's now done electronically, vice paper. When yeah. I first got here, it was being sent in a five-inch stack of paper, and then we went to a CD, and now we do it by email yeah. and I know this is this has got nothing to do with the conversation but I'll throw it out there. Sure. Has anybody ever thought about getting Congress to change the two hundred and fifty dollar reporting requirement? It's been that I think for fifty years. Maybe we could get rid of a lot of the reporting requirement <laughs> if we raised it to fifteen hundred dollars but that might be yeah. a subject for another day. Yeah, so I think uh, that's uh, that, that's not in my area of expertise. No, More yours, Patrick. No, I, th I think <laughs> at, at OGE, our, our relationship to the th uh, 31 USC 1353 is, is simply to make available those reports. Uh, GSA through the Federal Travel Regulation implements those requirements. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that would be uh, the, uh, maybe a question for those guys. Well, it's actually in the statute. I thought people actually argue me argue with me when they raise the gift thing, you know, what's I think it's now 375. Yeah, it's in the statute. Right. Did, did, did that get raised? And I said, no, mm -hmm. that's buried in the statute and doesn't change until Congress changes it. Because it has, it doesn't have an automatic escalator like the uh, reporting thresholds right. on uh, gifts and emoluments and what thanks have you. Well, well, thanks very much. We appreciate your call. Yeah, thank you very much for calling. All right, thanks.
I'm, I'm not well, showing any more on the uh, on the Hangout. Do we have any other calls on the phone, Holly? I do not show any additional questions at this time. Excellent. Can I just reiterate? Um, I am here in OGE. My job is managing records, OGE's records, but I'm also very much a part of a lot of the things that you're you're going through in your agencies. I happen to also handle all the Paperwork Reduction Act, a uh, fair amount of privacy, FOIA. You know, I, I'm I'm. In this kind of an operation, I do a lot of different things and, and, and work with a lot of different things, but I handle all the forms as well. When you have any issues or the others in your staff that have issues with these particular things, I'm happy to do whatever I can to either uh, take your idea uh, forward and when we're revising and we're expanding or we're improving on, uh, I hope improving, on mm -hmm. some of these different formats that for collecting information, what have you, um, uh, give me a call. You have questions about, uh, specifically about your situation with regards to what is what is going to work under the general record schedule or, or whether you have to go in for a special authority, which you can do your, as well. You can ask for an exception to the general record schedule, even GRS 2.8. Um, I'd be happy to give you guidance on what I think and whether or not I think it'll, it'll go any place if you want to try to, to get a variance. So um, uh, I'm here to help. And um, as I said, I do records. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much for listening to me today. I, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered that we had a, a, a good crowd here. And um, I look forward. To, uh, maybe I'll see some of you at the summit. Absolutely. Up. No, so thanks very much for joining us uh, today, Paul. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, you will be receiving a course evaluation uh, in the coming hours. And we do appreciate your feedback and suggestions for future training. And also, again, I remind you that next Thursday, we'll be here with Lenny Lowentritt from the General Services Administration to talk about travel regulations. Uh, so do look for that announcement. Uh, thank you all again, and thank you, Paul. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.